Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. ABC News, straightforward. They don't give it for their country per se, they give it for their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their fathers, their uncles, their aunts. And I, uh, it means I have trouble these days ever showing up at a veteran cemetery not thinking of my son. Oh, who uh, proudly insisted on putting on that uniform and going with his unit to Iraq and giving up his spot as Attorney General in the state of Delaware because he thought it was the right thing to do. Bringing Americans home at last. President Biden at Arlington National Cemetery, remembering all those who made the ultimate sacrifice as he formally puts an end to America's longest war. All troops will come home from Afghanistan by the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Three days after the death of Dante Wright, the now former officer in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, who shot him is charged with second degree manslaughter. This as we brace for another night of protests. The defense makes its case as to why Derek Chauvin's actions were justified. The doctor on the stand today testifying he would classify the cause of Floyd's death as undetermined. One day after hitting the pause button on J&J vaccine, a CDC panel declines to lift the pause. Tonight, it's unclear when Americans may be able to start receiving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine again. And as variants continue to spread, will Americans need to be ready to get a booster shot to protect themselves? Our Bob Woodruff is tracking the vaccine. And our conversation with the former Speaker of the House, John Boehner. Does he have a place in the Republican Party? And would he consider voting for Donald Trump again? Would you vote for Donald Trump again in 2024? Well, listen, that's a long way off. There's going to be a lot of candidates running. Uh, we'll, see who the, we'll see who the Republican nominee is. She stopped a fellow officer from performing a chokehold. She was fired, stripped of her pension. Now, 12 years later, the outcome, she says, is long overdue. This battle has been going on for many years at this point. What was your reaction when you finally got the news that the judge had ruled in your favor? I was excited. All I could do was just scream. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Stop killing us. That is the message from protesters in the streets of Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, a sentiment that is echoed throughout much of the black community nationwide. Today, the lawyer for 20-year-old Dante Wright's family called his death an intentional, deliberate, and unlawful use of force. This latest incident has ignited more protests and renewed conversations about police use of force in America. The officer who fired that fatal shot has now been charged with second-degree manslaughter. Body camera video shows her shouting, taser, 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 then firing her gun in Instead, the police chief, who later offered his resignation, called it an accidental discharge. Tonight, word that more than 3,000 National Guard members are now activated in Minnesota ahead of additional protests planned for this week. Stephanie Ramos leads us off. Tonight, the now former officer who killed Dante Wright charged with second degree manslaughter days after this traffic stop. According to the Washington County Attorney's Office, Kim Potter fired one round into Wright's left side with her Glock 9mm handgun after yelling, Taser, Taser, Taser. You can see a yellow taser on her belt in this photo. The office adding in a statement, certain occupations carry an immense responsibility and none more so than a sworn police officer. Today, the Wright family's lawyer questioning how Potter, a Brooklyn Center police veteran, appeared to have mixed up the two. At what point did you not feel that this was a gun in your hand versus a taser? And so the family, obviously, they are glad she got charged. Authorities say Potter, on the force for 26 years, was actually training another officer Sunday when Wright was pulled over for an expired tag. As they tried to arrest the unarmed 20-year-old for an outstanding warrant, a struggle broke out. Moments later, Potter firing that fatal shot. She resigned along with the police chief. 
For a third night in a row, protesters taking to the streets, outraged over the killing of the young father, the mother of his child, remembering him. He was a good father. He loved his son, and he wanted to see him grow up. He just was a very active father. That little boy now without his dad. Stephanie Ramos joins us now from outside of the jail where Kim Potter was booked. Stephanie, uh, what sort of time could she possibly be facing? Well, here in Minnesota, Potter, if convicted, she could face up to 10 years in prison. But according to sentencing guidelines, she would more likely face about four to five years. But, of course, we have to keep in mind that if this case goes to a jury, uh, she could also be acquitted, Lindsay. And, and paint a picture for us here. You're nearby where the Chauvin trial is taking place. How is the community responding to all this? Uh, we are very close, Lindsay. We are actually just about a block away from where the Chauvin trial is taking place. But as you can imagine, tensions have been really high in this community for the last several days uh, after the shooting of Dante Wright, but of course for the last year uh, after the death of George Floyd. So there is this tension in the air and authorities are anticipating more protests tonight. They have a curfew in place in order to try and maintain some sort of order. But all of this comes, these charges uh, against Kim uh, Potter come as the community residents here uh, are preparing for a verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial and uh, tensions remain pretty high here Lindsay certainly and so many wondering just how this latest shooting might impact that verdict Stephanie Ramos our thanks to you and now to the Derek Chauvin trial where the defense presented another theory on what might have killed George Floyd. And they also called on a pathologist to explain why he would have classified Floyd's death as something other than homicide. Alex Perez has the latest from Minneapolis. Today, the defense calling a forensic pathologist who testified that the manner of George Floyd's death, officially classified as a homicide, was actually undetermined, citing a series of potential causes, including heart disease and drug use. So in terms of Dr. Baker's analysis of this case, how did the heart and, heart and drugs contribute to the cause of death? They were significant or other contrib they, they contributed to um, Mr. Floyd having um, a sudden cardiac arrest, in my opinion. The defense also floating a new theory that Floyd inhaled carbon monoxide from the tailpipe of the squad car. Can you sum summarize briefly what your uh, opinions are in this case? Yes. So in my opinion, he would have the toxicology, the fentanyl and methamphetamine. Um, there is exposure to a vehicle exhaust, so potentially carbon monoxide poisoning, or at least an effect from increased carbon monoxide in his bloodstream, and paraganglionoma, or the other natural disease process that he has. So um, all of those combined to cause Mr. Floyd's death. Prosecutors then demanding proof and the witness admitting he had none. Just going right to the punchline of carbon monoxide that you, you talked about at some length, you haven't seen any data or test results that showed Mr. Floyd had a single injury from carbon monoxide. Is that true? That is correct because it was never sent to I the laboratory for that you whether, test. I ask you whether it was true, sir, yes or it no? It is true. Dr. David Fowler conceding the officers should have tried to help Floyd when he became non-responsive. Are you able to generally characterize where the sudden death took place? What you're referring to as a sudden death, and I may, may well have misinterpreted, I'm referring to as a sudden cardiac arrest. There's a difference between death and cardiac arrest. So where we are in this space where there is a space uh, between cardiac arrest and between the actual death, are you uh, suggesting that though Mr. Floyd may have been in cardiac arrest, there was a time when he may have been revived because he wasn't dead yet? Immediate medical attention for a person who's gone into cardiac arrest um, may, re may well um, reverse that process, yes. Do you feel that Mr. Floyd should have been given immediate emergency attention to try to reverse the cardiac arrest? As a physician, I would agree. Um, are you critical of the fact that he wasn't given 
immediate emergency care when he went into cardiac arrest. Yeah, as a physician, I would agree. Alex Perez joins us now. Alex, what can we expect next? Well, Lindsay, we expect the defense will rest their case tomorrow. So far, they've called seven witnesses. The prosecution called 38 witnesses. We could know who was more effective as early as next week once the jury gets this case. Lindsay? And local businesses are now preparing for the verdict whenever that may be. Yeah, Lindsay, you know, you can sort of feel the anticipation in the air, particularly here in downtown Minneapolis. A number, a number, several of businesses, number of businesses are already boarded up. They've been boarded up since this trial began. We've talked to some business owners. They tell me they're going to wait to see until all of this unfolds, until they get a verdict to determine when they're going to remove uh, all that boarding and reopen up. Lindsay? Yeah, lots of concern there about the potential outcome. Alex Perez, our thanks to you. And for more analysis, we bring in Shauna Lloyd, civil rights attorney with the Cochrane firm in Florida. Thanks for coming back on, Ms. Lloyd. We heard that testimony today from Dr. David Fowler, who said that Floyd's cause of death could be classified as undetermined instead of as a homicide. How convincing would you say that those arguments were? And do you think that this battle of the experts over cause of death will serve to confuse the jury or be enough just to, to plant the seed of reasonable doubt? Well, let's start with his testimony. I think some of his testimony um, was, they were definitely backtracking him on. For instance, the carbon monoxide that he brought up. They then got him to admit that he wasn't even sure whether the car was on, whether it was a hybrid. Those are big things to overlook as an expert when you're trying to determine these types of causes of death. He also admitted that Floyd could have received medical attention even after cardiac arrest, and that could have saved his life. So although his testimony may have been uh, stronger for the defense overall, the state was able to make some serious um, inroads in his testimony for their side. When the jurors are looking at these expert witnesses, they line them up. They think about the one that they heard, they think about what this one is saying, and they bring common sense into it. So when they hear things that are able to be disputed or he's able to, someone's able to backtrack him on as an expert, that talks and leads towards the lack of credibility in their mind. And, and Dr. Fowler really muddied the waters a bit more by suggesting that the carbon monoxide, as you mentioned, from the squad's car's tailpipe may have contributed to George Floyd's death. Even if that is true, wouldn't that also be Derek Chauvin's fault or, or could it help his defense in a meaningful way? It could help his defense in a meaningful way in the sense that what the state is arguing is his positioning and with the knee on the neck, that was the actual causation of the death. So what that essentially means is no matter what else happened, this had to actually be the biggest contributing factor to that death. This action needed to have led directly to the death. So that's where the reasonable doubt comes in. And these other theories, should a juror decide that it's a credible theory, they could say that is where I find reasonable doubt. But when you talk about this idea of the, the causation, right, that the prosecution needs to prove in this case, um, it, they don't have to say that the knee on the neck was the sole reason that he died, correct? Absolutely. Very right about that, Lindsay. It doesn't have to be the sole, but it does have to be the direct link as to the death. So he may have had other things, but if but for the knee, he would have survived, then what we're looking at is and should be a guilty verdict according to the law. As we near the end of this trial, which side would you say seems to have the stronger case? And do you think that it'll be tough for the jury to reach a verdict? I think right now the prosecution had laid such a solid foundation and the ability to make these inroads in the testimony of the defense experts weakening their testimony. I think right now the prosecution does have the stronger case. I think the jury is going to be, it's always interesting. They go in there, they deliberate. You don't know how long they'll be in there. And it only takes one, Lindsay. That's what we have to keep remembering is that one person is all it takes to ensure that this jury doesn't reach a verdict because in Minnesota, it does require a unanimous verdict. And, and lastly, what potential impact could this latest shooting of Dante Wright have on the jury and verdict and, and possible appeal? There's going to be a lot of impact, I think, as these jurors are hearing this, they're knowing what's going on. It's still going to affect them. Now, the judge is going to instruct them 
as they will get these instructions at the end, that nothing outside of what they've heard in the courtroom dealing with this case is supposed to affect their deliberations. But we all know that, you know, with life happening, people are aware. So I think at some point there is a bit of an emotional impact that does happen for jurors. Attorney Shauna Lloyd, thank you so much for your time. As many Americans wonder what's next when it comes to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, late this afternoon, a panel of advisors said they did not feel comfortable making recommendations to the CDC on how to proceed yet. Meanwhile, the White House insists this pause should reinforce confidence in vaccine safety. Steve Osinsami is outside the CDC headquarters in Atlanta. A CDC advisory panel tonight says it needs more time and information to respond to the new concerns about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which means for now, Americans should continue holding off using this brand of the COVID vaccine. We do not have to arrive at a vote today or a recommendation today. If we need more time to think about this, we can reconvene later this week or this weekend. A very small number of women who suffered blood clots after getting the shot caused health officials to put a hold on using the drug. Health officials here worry that this potential adverse reaction looks a little too similar to what happened in Europe with the AstraZeneca vaccine. The AstraZeneca vaccine is made using similar technology as the Johnson & Johnson. And in Europe, 19 people died. There are some rather strong similarities about this with regard to the time frame following vaccination, particularly importantly, the clinical syndrome of these clots together with low platelets. So there are a lot of similarities there that you just can't miss that. The scientists are looking for any link between the six women who got sick and they're investigating whether the blood clots were an immune response. All six women were between 18 and 48 years old. They got sick within two weeks of getting vaccinated. Some of the clots formed in veins of the sinus and prevented blood from draining out of the brain. One woman died, three are still hospitalized. The holdup on using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has had a huge impact on these 7,000 locations where it was the only shot they were giving. One out of every four vaccine locations in America was only using Johnson & Johnson. I get why they're doing it out of the abundance of caution, but the, the, the statistics were so low for someone like myself to get you know, the blood clotting they were talking about and all that. I was willing to take the risk anyway. The race is on to find available shots from Pfizer and Moderna for appointments that are already scheduled. So all the Pfizer and all the Johnson I have, of course, it makes it very hard because I have literally hundreds of doses of Johnson that I can't use. They're pretty frustrated at this clinic in Los Angeles that's already been struggling to vaccinate underserved communities. Tonight, the Biden administration is saying that there's still more than enough vaccine. I want to be clear that we have more than enough Pfizer and Moderna vaccine supply to continue or even accelerate the current pace of vaccinations. Steve Osinsami joins us now. Steve, any idea when the advisory committee is planning to meet again? Lindsay, they have a meeting scheduled for May 5th, but they're hoping they can meet again in the next week or so. They didn't want to make a decision today without all the proper information, the facts that they say. They also point out that they're still watching about 3 million Americans who recently got a Johnson & Johnson vaccine within the last few weeks. They say it's still very possible we could see a few more of those rare cases that concern them. Lindsay? Steve Osinsami reporting in for us. Thanks so much, Steve. America's longest war now has an end date. Today, President Biden officially announced that all U.S. troops will be out of Afghanistan by the 20th anniversary of September 11th. Mary Bruce has those details. At Arlington Cemetery tonight, President Biden honoring the lives lost as he announced he's ending the 20-year war in Afghanistan, withdrawing all U.S. troops by this September 11th. It's time to end America's longest war. Over the last two decades, 2,312 Americans were killed, more than 20,000 wounded, and nearly $825 billion spent. Biden today saying they succeeded in responding to the 9-11 attacks. We delivered justice to bin Laden a decade ago, and we've stayed in Afghanistan for a decade since. Since then, our reasons for remaining in Afghanistan have become increasingly unclear. On Capitol Hill today, the head of the CIA with a sobering assessment. 
when the time comes for the U.S. military to withdraw, the U.S. government's ability to collect and act on threats will diminish. That's simply a fact. But he also said al-Qaeda, the group behind 9-11, does not have the capacity today to carry out an attack against the U.S. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. And Mary, President Biden stood in the very same place where President Bush announced the nation was going to war 20 years ago. Any word on whether or not he's consulted with previous presidents on this decision? Well, the president did say that he actually informed former President George W. Bush yesterday of this decision. He didn't say how the former president responded, but Biden did take time in his remarks to note that despite their disagreements over the years, he said he and Bush are absolutely united in their respect and support for the valor and courage of the men and women who have served. It seems President Biden also consulted with former President Obama, who today issued a statement saying he supports this decision, saying that it was the right move by President Biden. And Mary, there are also questions about just how the Taliban will take this news and, and what they plan to do. And in fact, Lindsay, a, a new intelligence assessment out just yesterday on this very topic had a pretty grim picture to paint, saying, quote, the Afghan government will struggle to hold the Taliban at bay if the coalition withdraws support. There are a lot of questions here about what this is going to look like going forward. And also some questions about what has been the U.S.'s other mission here, the diplomatic mission, especially, especially the efforts to try and uh, uh, protect women, the rights of Afghans women. The president today saying they will, of, of course, continue to try and protect them going forward, but saying that diplomacy doesn't hinge on having boots on the ground, Lindsay. Lots of uncertainty still. Mary Bruce reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. A new report by the Capitol Police Department's own inspector general is giving us new insights into the failures that led to the January 6th domestic terror attack on the Capitol. The report bluntly stating Capitol Police were ill-prepared. Pierre Thomas has more from our nation's capital. Tonight, a new inspector general report revealing just three days before the attack, Capitol Police intelligence analysts wrote that Congress itself is the target and that the Stop the Steal movement had the likelihood of attracting white supremacists, militia members, and others who actively promote violence. Today, the intelligence failure drawing sharp criticism from the senator who chairs the committee overseeing the Capitol Police. In the end, um, they didn't do what they needed to do. The Inspector General's findings in sharp contrast to former Capitol security officials who recently told Congress they could not have anticipated the broad violence that left more than 100 officers injured and possibly killed another. No entity, including the FBI, provided any new intelligence regarding January 6th. The Inspector General also finding stunning security failures the day of the insurrection. Shields that easily shattered from the blows from the mob. Some officers vulnerable without shields because they were locked away inside a bus. And the inspector general questioning why officers were also told not to use the most aggressive force against the mob, like stun grenades, which might have helped push back the rioters. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, what have you learned about the officer who shot one of the rioters? Listen, we now know that prosecutors have closed the investigation into the fatal shooting of Ashley Babbitt, who was killed by Capitol Police when she tried to climb through a broken window during the attack. Authorities say the officer justifiably fired in self-defense and to defend Congress, Lindsay. Pierre Thomas reporting in from the nation's capital. Thanks so much, Pierre. And when we come back, the stunning confrontation, the video that shows a white man berating a black man for allegedly walking in a neighborhood, the charge that's now being filed. Our conversation with John Boehner, former Speaker of the House, if former President Trump runs again, will he vote for him despite making disparaging comments about him in his book? But up next, she lost her job and benefits at one point for stopping a fellow officer from putting a chokehold on a handcuffed suspect. That decision was recently vacated. What this former officer thinks about police in America next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's such a bizarre story. Sometimes I don't even believe that it happened to me. The betrayal was just unimaginable. I don't even have words for that kind of evil. 
I have written over 30 crime novels, but this story, it baffles me. Here's the thing, we as human beings think that no one can really read us, but we kind of can read other people. The more we think that, the more we get it wrong. The devil never sleeps. Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on the with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. When they arrived, they found a very grisly scene. There was no signs of forced entry. Winger said he found Harrington beating his wife with a hammer, and to save her, he shot Harrington twice in the head. The detectives came to the conclusion that Mark Winger acted in self-defense, and the case was closed within approximately 48 hours. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. And in comes this young, beautiful nanny who wants to help out this poor man. Show Grandma how you stand in your crib. It was my purpose to make this family whole again. Mark and I eloped. We went to Maui. Now they're going to Hawaii and getting married? Like, seriously? Can I say it on camera? What the f I'm sorry, but... Seriously. There's something going on here that we missed. Was this the moment when Mark went from thinking about murder, maybe even fantasizing about murder, and realized, I can maybe pull it off? I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. Now Friday night, new interviews, stunning details. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. This is just taking a turn for the surreal. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. The devil never sleeps. This man, Jerry Elders, is facing charges tonight for a police ambush and deadly carjacking in Texas. Police say that he shot and wounded an officer during a traffic stop. He's then accused of later killing a woman and stealing her pickup. Police are searching for two other people who were with him at the time of that traffic stop. A former Buffalo police officer was granted eligibility for her lifetime pension after more than 12 years of legal battle. Carrie Allhorn, a nearly 20-year veteran of the force, made headlines back in 2006 when she says she stopped a fellow officer from performing a chokehold on a handcuffed suspect. She was fired in 2008, mere months before she was eligible for that pension. Carrie Allhorn joins us now. Thank you so much for your time. As we mentioned, this battle has been going on for many years at this point. What was your reaction when you finally got the news that the judge had ruled in your favor? I was excited. All I could do was just scream. I was just happy. Were you expecting it? I expected a ruling, and I just tried to remain positive. So when um, I got the call, um, my attorney, Intasar, um, Rob called and she said, I have news for you. And um, she said, I'll just tell you in two words. We won. <laughs> and for people who don't know, talk us through what happened back in 2006 and why you took the action that you did. Well, in 2006, there was a handcuffed um, person, Neil Mack, who was being choked by Officer Gregory Kwiatkowski. And I stopped the, ch the choke hold, and I was fired for it. How did you go about stopping the choke hold? I grabbed his arm from around Neil Mack's neck. And then you were fired? Yes, I was. We're talking about 2008, then that same year, the officer that you had stopped from using a chokehold was promoted to lieutenant. He sued you for defamation and won a $65,000 judgment. You've subsequently worked various jobs at times. You've even had to live in your car. He later went on to prison after an incident stemming from an arrest of four black teenagers. Do you feel that you've finally gotten some vindication? And if so, do you feel that it came only at the expense of George Floyd? Well, I certainly think that it came at the expense of George Floyd, um, unfortunately. Um, had there been a Cario's law, which I had written back in 2016, had it been passed prior to now, it could have been a national law, and it could have prevented the officers from standing by watching um, 
Derek Chauvin killed George Floyd. Police accountability is certainly a big and hot button topic right now. Being a former officer, why do you think that it's gotten as bad as it has? And what do you feel needs to happen in order to improve the criminal justice system? It's gotten as bad as it has because there has been no accountability. And I think that it can get better by passing Cario's law on the national level. Um, so therefore, the officers do have a duty to intervene so they cannot stand around and watch another officer hurt or kill someone. Do you think that officers aren't undergoing uh, enough training or is it simply implicit bias? Well, the first training you get is home training and we don't know what people are learning at home. So we don't know what biases they, they come into the job with. And then if you come into the job and someone has that same bias, um, and they tend to let you get away with literal, literal murder, then um, it affects us all. You've mentioned Cariel's law a few times in this conversation. Explain how that rule works. It, it, certainly you fought to get it adopted and, and ultimately it helped your own case. Well, Cariel, exactly. Cariel's law is the duty to intervene. Um, and the reason it's named Cario's Law is because in 2016, when I wrote it, I decided I did not want another officer to go through what I had gone through for doing what is right. And it helped me because the judge uh, cited it in the case um, when he made his decision. So ultimately, I wrote my own freedom papers. <laughs> Cario, we thank you again for your time, for sharing your story. And once again, congratulations to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Still ahead here on Prime, the search continues for missing crew members somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico lost at sea after their boat capsized during a strong storm. He was the mastermind of the biggest investment fraud ever, robbing friends and clients of billions. He died serving a 150-year sentence, the legacy of Bernie Madoff. And it is the longest war in American history. But what did we gain? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, a message from the company Coinbase, the crypto exchange that just went public as a record amount of money continues to pour into cryptocurrencies. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Tomorrow, the Sharks are taking a huge bite out of these small business deals and steals just for you. With deals starting as low as $7.50. All awesome businesses. And wait until you see how TikTok's helping teens and adults quit vaping. Tomorrow on ABC's Good Morning America. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Walking a mile in people's boots and buying a new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. The devil never 
There's one more huge twist. 2020, Friday night on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show. ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for over all excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. As we reported, President Biden said that he will withdraw all U.S. troops from Afghanistan before September 11th because, quote, it's time to end America's longest war. We take a closer look by the numbers. We are now approaching the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks and the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. Biden is the fourth U.S. president to preside over the American troop presence in that country. Roughly 2,500 U.S. troops remain in Afghanistan. American troop levels reached a high of 100,000 troops of August of 10, 2010 and stayed at that level for much of the next year. And it's estimated that more than 800,000 Americans have served at least one tour in Afghanistan. All told, more than 2,300 U.S. troops have died in this war and another 20,000 troops have been wounded. Plus, more than 43,000 Afghan civilians have been killed. That's according to the Watson Institute at Brown University. $825 billion, that's the cost to date of U.S. military operations in Afghanistan, according to the Pentagon. And finally, zero. That's how many lasting ceasefires there have been in decades of fighting. A reminder that this war is not over, even if U.S. forces will no longer be a part of it. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Former Speaker of the House John Boehner out with his new book where he calls himself the mayor of Crazy Town. We ask him about his regrets and what he would have done differently. And First Lady Dr. Jill Biden undergoing a medical procedure will explain but first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. tell all our patients how much they're loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. We're talking with Oscar nominees, A-listers, and insiders about everything. Inside the Oscars. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Walking a mile in people's boots and buying a new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Thank you. 
Tonight, the now former officer who killed Dante Wright charged with second degree manslaughter days after this traffic stop. According to the Washington County Attorney's Office, Kim Potter fired one round into Wright's left side with her Glock 9mm handgun after yelling, Taser, Taser, Taser. You can see a yellow taser on her belt in this photo. The office adding in a statement, certain occupations carry an immense responsibility and none more so than a sworn police officer. Today, the Wright family's lawyer questioning how Potter, a Brooklyn Center police veteran, appeared to have mixed up the two. Obviously, they are glad she got charged. What do you have to say for yourself? Bernie Madoff, the mastermind behind the world's largest Ponzi scheme, has died. Madoff died of natural causes at a federal prison medical center in North Carolina. He was 82 years old. Bernie Madoff had been in a wheelchair and on dialysis before he died in prison. A broken man, his attorney said. Madoff had lost two sons while in prison, one to cancer, the other to suicide. And defense attorney Brandon Sample told us Madoff carried tremendous guilt. From his perception, there's always been a one-sided narrative that his crimes were just so heinous that there was no way for him to be forgiven. His investors included retirees and celebrities like director Steven Spielberg, actor Kevin Bacon, and Major League Baseball pitcher Sandy Koufax. Today, one of Madoff's victims said she never felt that Madoff had any remorse. I think I felt more than anything else sadness. A fraud which impacted over 60,000 people uh, that the truth will never come out. On paper, Madoff's victims lost $65 billion, though much of that money never existed. About $14 billion has been recovered, but for some victims, the losses were ruinous. A U.S. Army sergeant in South Carolina has been charged with third-degree assault after a tense confrontation in his gated neighborhood. You better walk away. You walk away. This video going viral showing Army Sergeant Jonathan Pentland shoving a young black man walking in his neighborhood, threatening him and telling him to go away now. The man tells him he lives nearby. The woman who shot the video says when police arrived, they gave Pentland a citation for malicious injury to property for allegedly slapping the young man's phone out of his hand and cracking it. Officials at Fort Jackson, where Pentland is stationed, say they're looking at the incident as well. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden underwent a medical procedure today, President Biden going with her to an outpatient center this morning. The White House calling it a common medical procedure, saying she is fine and now resuming her normal schedule. Okay. Reaction from Bachelor Nation following star Colton Underwood's emotional reveal to Robin Roberts that he's gay. I'm still the same Colton everybody met on TV. I'm still the same Colton to my friends and my family. I just happen to be able to share with people now all of me. And I am proud of that. You know, I am proud to be gay. One thing about being labeled the Virgin Bachelor is I fully was a virgin before that, and I could never give anybody a good enough answer of why I was a virgin. And the truth is, I was a virgin bachelor because I was gay, and I didn't know how to handle it. When you're not living your full self, and you're always, like, not necessarily on guard, but there's a heaviness to it, how did you manage that? I didn't manage it well. I put myself in really bad situations on purpose. I put myself in these situations so I could try to force myself to be straight. I still would say thank you for making me a bachelor, but we got there in a roundabout way of like, finally, I'm, I am healthy, but I am healthy and happy because of moments like that. Host Chris Harrison praised the 29-year-old, saying he's proud and happy for him. Among the chorus of show alum voicing their support, Demi Burnett, who came out as queer, tweeted, welcome to the community, brother. The Coast Guard continues their search for 12 people who are missing after strong winds may have caused a boat to capsize off the Louisiana coast. Thankfully, they did manage to rescue six others. Elwin Lopez brings us the latest on this desperate search. Tonight off the Louisiana coast, a race against time to find survivors from this capsized vessel. We were saturating the area with available resources uh, to assist in the rescue mission. 19 people were on board the Seacorp Power when it capsized during unusually powerful storms. The 129-foot vessel has 250-foot legs that can raise it out of the water to work on offshore platforms. 
Winds gusting to 75 miles per hour in the area. A good Samaritan sending a distress message just before 4.30 p.m. The Coast Guard and Good Samaritans saving six people from the rough seas, finding one other person who did not survive. Families of the missing anxiously awaiting word tonight. Trying to hold our heads up and still try to be positive and just, just stand on faith, you know. Our thanks to Elwin for that. And we turn now to politics. Tonight, we're joined by John Boehner, the Republican Speaker of the House from 2011 to 2015, who is out with a new Pull No Punches book called On the House, a Washington memoir. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Speaker. Good to be with you. So you entered Congress in 1991, inspired, you write, by President Ronald Reagan. But you say that Reagan wouldn't recognize today's Republican Party and certainly couldn't get elected in it. Why is, why is that? Well, I just think that uh, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was for tax increases back when he was uh, governor and early part of his presidency. Uh, frankly, uh, he signed a big immigration bill uh, that allowed uh, uh, what, what some people would call, uh, well, I'm not sure what the word is off the top of my head, but uh, allowed a lot of people to become legal citizens who came here uh, without documents. And, uh, and so I just think that uh, uh, the party of Reagan, as people like to say, uh, is uh, is a little more conservative today than it was then. You tell a lot of stories with a lot of colorful language, but then at one point you write, here's the real point of these stories. Most of these guys who poke their heads up in these crises and vote no on every compromise and claim they're doing it for conservative principles don't actually give an expletive about fiscal responsibility. You go on to say none of these guys said anything when the Trump administration added $1 trillion to the federal budget deficit by the end of 2019. These are the same people who are willing to destroy our economy to make their point, but went on to suddenly abandon this core principle because it's not really about money. It's about principle. It's about chaos. If it were about principle, they'd have stuck to their principles no matter who was in power. Why would politicians enjoy chaos? Well, these days, uh, you can create yourself out of a whole cloth uh, with all of these social media uh, platforms. You've got talk radio. You've got conservative TV. Uh, and, and chaos sells. Uh, you know, you can get a lot of attention. You get a lot of attention, you can probably raise a little money, and all of a sudden, uh, you're a player. And so you don't have to govern, you can just, be, just make noise, which is what a lot of them do. And going back to your time in office, by 2011, you say that you saw yourself as, quote, mayor of crazy town, writing that you were trying to drive a clown car on the Republican side of the House. You essentially say that the Tea Party and Freedom Caucus hijacked the GOP on your watch. What do you think you personally could have done differently then to neutralize the people who you now call, quote, crazies and kooks? Well, listen, I worked uh, every day uh, to help those members become good members. And frankly, most of the so-called Tea Party members who got elected in 2010 uh, turned out to be good Republican members. Uh, but, you know, we had 210, 215 good Republican members, and then we had two or three dozen knuckleheads uh, who just wanted to vote no every time and weren't really interested in governing. Uh, but every day I would work to try to bring them around, push back on them, whatever I had to do uh, to, as the leader of the team, uh, to have a real team. Uh, I wish I had to have more success. In 2013, congressional Republicans refused to raise the debt ceiling unless Obamacare was defunded. It was a move that you called a dumb, expletive idea, but you eventually caved. What kind of pressure did you feel within your own ranks, and do you have any regrets about that? Well, no, listen, I, in my book, uh, there's a banerism in there. It's real simple. A leader without followers is simply a man taking a walk. Uh, I had spent uh, two months uh, trying to tell my colleagues that this really was a really dumb idea, that Barack Obama and Harry Reid and the Democrats were never going to agree to get rid of Obamacare in exchange for increasing the debt ceiling. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a suicide mission. Uh, but after Labor Day in 2013, when I told them for about the fifth time that this was really a bad idea, uh, I saw normal, regular members uh, marching uh, uh, along with them. And the uh, next thing you know, uh, I was about to be a leader without followers, and so I did, after what a leader does. I jumped in front of my troops. These are the people who elected me to be leader. And so uh, I led this fight for them uh, for 16 days. Uh, it was uh, one of the dumber things that I've seen, but when you're the leader, 
Uh, every once in a while, you get pushed to do things you don't want to do. And Nancy Pelosi went through this with impeachment a few years ago. And you start the book talking about a golf trip where Donald Trump, well before he was running for president, ends up being your partner. At one point in the book, you say that not reaching a grand bargain on spending and entitlement reform is your biggest regret. But in that same vein of golf, if you could do a, a, a mulligan, a do-over in your political career, is that what it would be? Yeah, I think uh, the grand bargain I was working on with President Obama uh, was uh, uh, well, it was it would have been a big deal. It would have brought real brought real fiscal responsibility uh, to our government. Would have put us on a path uh, to finally balancing uh, the budget at some point. And uh, but immigration reform would be the second biggest regret that I had. Uh, I wanted to do a broad immigration reform bill, just like President Obama did. Uh, yeah, we had a few differences, but frankly, I think we could have worked those out. Uh, I wish we would have. While some might describe Mitch McConnell as a bipartisanship killer, you write that Joe Biden, Mitch McConnell, and Chuck Schumer are, quote, old negotiating pros. So that being said, do you think that together they'll be able to achieve any major bipartisan wins and overcome the traditional gridlock of D.C.? Well, we'll see. I, I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, but I've got uh, concerns about it. Now, right now, both political parties are being held hostage by the loudest voices in their parties. Uh, and it's really preventing Joe Biden from working with uh, uh, Mitch McConnell and, uh, and McConnell, frankly, from working with Biden. Uh, but at some point, uh, America needs Congress to come together uh, and to help solve some of our problems. Uh, infrastructure would be one. We've been in bad need of a big infrastructure improvement bill. Uh, we got a big opportunity to do it. Uh, I'm not sure the, the Biden proposal is the answer, uh, but at least it's a start. I'd like to play a clip here back to Trump for a moment. You voted for him in 2020, but you say that you were shocked by what happened on January 6th. Let's take a listen. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Would you vote for Donald Trump again in 2024? Well, listen, that's a long way off. There's going to be a lot of candidates running. Uh, we'll see who the we'll see who the Republican nominee is. So you would consider uh, very disappointed. I was very disappointed with what happened after uh, the election, uh, the president uh, claiming the election was stolen without providing any facts, uh, really exercising an awful lot of Americans uh, who didn't know any better. Uh, and then we had uh, January 6th. It was a sad moment in American history, a very sad moment. So you would consider it? I said, I'll see who the Republican nominee is in 2024. Right, but so it's not off the table. We'll see who the nominee is. We're, we're three years away from uh, 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 the next election, three and a half years away from the next election. I don't know who's going to be the nominee. All right, lastly, what's the future of Trumpism in America, and do you think that Trump's hold over the GOP will continue? Well, if I were a Republican uh, leader these days, I'd focus on Republican principles, fiscal responsibility. Uh, things like a strong national defense. Uh, those are the things that hold Republicans together as a party. Uh, it's not about personalities. Uh, focusing on those principles will do the party well in the future. Speaker Boehner, thank you so much for your time. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. With funeral preparations underway for the late Prince Philip, more details are starting to emerge, including who will be allowed to attend and how elaborate the ceremony can be in the midst of COVID. ABC's Maggie Rooley now reports from London. New reports that Prince Philip's grandsons, Prince William and Prince Harry, have been in touch. But due to COVID regulations, Harry won't see his family until the day of the funeral. No matter what the family difficulties and problems are, I think that they rightly will put all their problems aside um, for this particular day. Unlike most royal funerals, there'll be no heads of state or other big names. Instead, coronavirus restrictions limit the number of guests to just 30 people. Even the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is giving up his seat so that close friends and family can pay their respects. The fact that it's a scaled down funeral is exactly what Prince Philip would have wanted because really it's all about family in the end, whether you're a king or a pauper. The prince's coffin, flanked by members of the military, saluting one of their own, will be carried towards St. George's Chapel in a Land Rover that the prince himself helped to design. Members of the royal family, led by Prince Charles, will walk behind the casket. A bell will toll and gun salutes will be fired as they make their way. I feel it will have a military feel to it, but it will also obviously 
pay homage to his work, uh, to the Crown, and to his further service to the Commonwealth. Prince Harry flew in from the States, his first time in the UK in more than a year. Our thanks to Maggie for that. And tonight, some news about us. Kimberly Godwin has been named the next president of ABC News. She becomes the first African-American to lead a broadcast network's news division. Most recently, she worked at CBS, serving as their executive vice president of news. Peter Rice, the chairman of Disney General Entertainment Content, says throughout her career, she has distinguished herself as a fierce advocate for excellence, collaboration, and inclusion. We look forward to officially welcoming her here next month. And next to a future phenom, we are celebrating the success of a young man who is really going places. Stanford, for one. He is the first black male valedictorian at Oakland Technical High School, and now he is starting his own nonprofit to help spread his own love of science to other children. Kids Cube is a youth-led nonprofit organization whose mission is to introduce youth to the wonders of science through fun, affordable, and accessible means. You don't need to be in a lab with millions of dollars of equipment to be a scientist. You can find science in a potato and make a battery out of it. You can make a clock with a stick. I have a younger niece and nephew, and I was babysitting them one time over quarantine when I asked them if they wanted to try out science experiments. And they told me no, that they hated science. And so I went to my room, I designed some experiments with stuff we could find around the house. And they loved it and they gained confidence in science. I was thinking, wow, science is awesome. When you do it and you get to know science, it's like your best friend. It was really nice to see her challenge herself in, in a different way. I noticed that she spent less time watching TV and playing on her phone, and she spent lots of time trying to understand her science project. I also have some science experiments in my room, and I can go do those when I'm bored. I just love science now. It changed my life. I officially launched Kids Cube June 14th of 2020. The joy that they felt is what I wanted to share with other children like them, other children in my community. I initially got these kits for her because it was the beginning of the pandemic and she was having a really hard time. She was really bored. I didn't really know much about science. There's so much fun stuff to learn about it. And you could do so much stuff with science. Science is all around you. The revenue that we generate is what allows us to donate kits to students who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford them. We've been able to donate close to 3,000 science kits just in the Oakland Unified School District alone. In the fall, I'm planning on attending Stanford University. I'm gonna spend my time engineering systems that can make the world a better place, that can bring water to people, bring food to people, make healthcare more accessible. There are gonna be people who don't believe in you, but if, as long as you have that belief in yourself and you're willing to put in that work, I think that you'll be able to overcome whatever it is. Benjamin Banneker, Lewis Latimer, Macy Jameson, and Percy Julian, all these great contributions to science made by people of color. And if you know that and study your history, then you know that there is nothing in the world that you can accomplish. Kids falling in love with science. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, an upside down American flag with the names of people of color killed in police custody and in other incidents. This flag was pictured during a protest in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota for Dante Wright. An officer, of course, was charged today in his death. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, staying on top of several things, including are we going to need booster shots to beat these COVID variants? Bob Woodruff has this week's vaccine watch. And stick around for Robin's remarkable interview with a former Bachelor star who came out today. How after years of struggles, he decided now is the time to reveal his truth. It's such a bizarre story. Sometimes I don't even believe that it happened to me. The betrayal was just unimaginable. I don't even have words for that kind of evil. I've written over 30 crime novels, but this story, it baffles me. Here's the thing, we as human beings think that no one can really read us, but we kind of can read other people. The more we think that, the more we get it wrong. The devil never sleeps.
Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. When they arrived, they found a very grisly scene. There was no signs of forced entry. Winger said he found Harrington beating his wife with a hammer, and to save her, he shot Harrington twice in the head. The detectives came to the conclusion that Mark Winger acted in self-defense, and the case was closed within approximately 48 hours. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. And in comes this young, beautiful nanny who wants to help out this poor man. Show Grandma how you stand in your crib. It was my purpose to make this family whole again. Mark and I eloped. We went to Maui. Now they're going to Hawaii and getting married? Like, seriously, can I say it on camera? What the f I'm sorry, but seriously. There's something going on here that we missed. Was this the moment when Mark went from thinking about murder, maybe even fantasizing about murder, and realized, I can maybe pull it off? I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. Now Friday night, new interviews, stunning details. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. This has just taken a turn for the surreal. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. The devil never sleeps. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The now former officer who killed Dante Wright has been charged with second-degree manslaughter three days after the traffic encounter that took his life. Prosecutors say Kim Potter fired one round into Wright's left side with a Glock after yelling, Taser, Taser, Taser. She could face up to 10 years behind bars if convicted. She is now out on bond. America's longest war will soon be coming to an end. President Biden announcing U.S. US troops will be withdrawing from Afghanistan by the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Republicans in Congress are pushing back, as many did when President Trump announced during his term that he wanted to pull back forces from there, too. Biden is the fourth president to preside over troops in Afghanistan, and today he said he would be the last. A new scathing report from a watchdog accuses Capitol Police of ignoring intelligence warnings ahead of the January 6th attack. The inspector general found multiple failures from expired weapons and riots shields that shattered on impact, saying that officers were outnumbered, ill-equipped, and unprepared. Today in the Derek Chauvin trial, the defense presented another theory as to what may have killed George Floyd, and they also called on a pathologist to explain why he would have classified Floyd's death as something other than homicide. ABC's Alex Perez has the very latest from Minneapolis. Today, the defense calling a forensic pathologist who testified that the manner of George Floyd's death, officially classified as a homicide, was actually undetermined, citing a series of potential causes, including heart disease and drug use. So in terms of Dr. Baker's analysis of this case, how did the heart and, heart and drugs contribute to the cause of death? They were significant or other contrib they, they contributed to um, Mr. Floyd having um, a sudden cardiac arrest, in my opinion. The defense also floating a new theory that Floyd inhaled carbon monoxide from the tailpipe of the squad car. Can you sum summarize briefly what your uh, opinions are in this case? Yes. So in my opinion, he would have the toxicology, the fentanyl and methamphetamine. Um, there is exposure to a vehicle exhaust, so potentially carbon monoxide poisoning, or at least an effect from increased carbon monoxide in his bloodstream, and paraganglionoma, or the other natural disease process that he has. So um, all of those combined to cause Mr. Floyd's death. Prosecutors then demanding proof and the witness admitting he had none. Just going right to the punchline of carbon monoxide that you, you talked about at some length, 
you haven't seen any data or test results that showed Mr. Floyd had a single injury from carbon monoxide. Is that true? That is correct because it was never sent to I the laboratory for that whether, test. I ask you whether it was true, sir. Yes or it no? It is true. Dr. David Fowler conceding the officers should have tried to help Floyd when he became non-responsive. Are you able to generally characterize where the sudden death took place? What you're referring to as a sudden death, and I may, may well have misinterpreted, I'm referring to as a sudden cardiac arrest. There's a difference between death and cardiac arrest. So when we are in this space where there is a space uh, between cardiac arrest and between the actual death, are you uh, suggesting that though Mr. Floyd may have been in cardiac arrest, there was a time when he may have been revived because he wasn't dead yet? Immediate medical attention for a person who's gone into cardiac arrest um, may, re may well um, reverse that process, yes. Do you feel that Mr. Floyd should have been given immediate emergency attention to try to reverse the cardiac arrest? As a physician, I would agree. Um, are you critical of the fact that he wasn't given immediate emergency care when he went into cardiac arrest? Yeah, as a physician, I would agree. Our thanks to Alex for that. And for more trial analysis, we bring in former Philadelphia DA Kelly Hodge. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Hodge. With the defense presenting its case, we've now gotten into a so-called battle of the experts. Today, Dr. Fowler testified that Floyd's heart problems and drug use were significant contributors to his death. How much did this testimony help Derek Chauvin? And more broadly, how should the jurors figure out which experts to believe? Thank you for having me uh, join you. And, and I appreciate the question. Um, I think that you know, it's hard to actually gauge how impactful um, Dr. Fowler's testimony will be. Um, what was interesting is that while he said that drugs and or his heart condition um, and, and his use of drugs and contributing to his heart condition were also causes or related causes of his death, he could not excuse nor did he excuse the fact that um, the, the neck or the um, officer being on the neck, Derek Chauvin, leaning when being on his neck for over nine minutes and 29 sec seconds was impactful and actually a causation to his death. So there's no way um, to exclude the fact that but for uh, Officer Chauvin being on the neck of George Floyd, that that in fact was a causal nexus to the, uh, the death of George Floyd. And I think with each answer um, that was given by the expert, um, all of the experts, that that's something that was uh, thematic throughout, that all of them stated that just to different degrees. Dr. Fowler did say that Floyd should have been given medical care. Let's take a listen. Are you critical of the fact that he wasn't given immediate emergency care when he went into cardiac arrest? Yeah, as a physician, I would agree. George Floyd was in police custody. Didn't Derek Chauvin also have a duty to get him the help that he needed? He did. He had a duty to get him the help that he needed. Um, this was obviously um, admitted to uh, by the defense expert and was also stated on direct examination through the various uh, witnesses that were called by the state in order to go ahead and present their case in chief. And, and speaking to that, we're coming close to the end of the trial and jury deliberations. How do you think that the prosecution can really weave together all of the evidence that they've presented over many days into a powerful closing argument? That's a that's a really um, a very good question because I think now that we are anticipating that the closing arguments are going to be coming forth next week and we are now at day 13 of the trial and and we know that um, what we expect the prosecution to do is to do what they've done throughout. They've been very methodical and very deliberate um, in dissecting um, on cross-examination those points that they wanted to extract out from the defense witnesses to poke holes in their uh, their their case or their, or their testimony and also weave in the strength of the witnesses and, and the consistency of the testimony that really goes to promote their theory of that there is no question about cause of death um, and that there is no question about that the use of force was unreasonable. And on the flip side, when we're talking about the defense, what do you think that their best chance of establishing reasonable doubt is in the jury's mind? Um, I think the defense has, has a difficult task. I think what they're going to look to do is 
equally take the the charge that the judge will give the court will give to the jurors in terms of actually um, what the elements are for each of the offenses and see if there's a way to dissect the language in the charge in order to show that there was no clear evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the cause of death was by the actions of Derek Chauvin um, and that the use of force in their opinion based on their witness was not unreasonable um, and that objectively it was reasonable based upon the testimony that they um, brought forth through their, their witness yesterday. I, I think that it's going to be a difficult um, argument to make because of the volume of witnesses um, with equal expertise um, who have already come forth, including the chief of police for the Minneapolis Police Department, amongst others, that have stated that the use of force was excessive and unreasonable. And so I think that the defense is just going to try to see what they can do to really dissect the language and hopefully convince one person um, that Derek Chauvin is not responsible for any of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt, and he's not guilty. Attorney Kelly Hodge, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Thank you so much for having me. While Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is temporarily paused, Moderna and Pfizer are now looking ahead in the fight against the pandemic, with both companies working on potential booster shots to target COVID-19 variants. So could we soon be taking a COVID booster vaccine in the future the same way we have an annual flu shot? Our Bob Woodruff takes a look in this week's Vaccine Watch. The next stage of the battle against COVID-19 is already underway. Pfizer and Moderna taking their first steps. Sometime around, I think January, I was contacted to see if I would be interested in receiving uh, booster vaccines. Becky Timmons was part of Pfizer's stage one vaccine trials last year. And once it was authorized, her friends, her family, all began to receive the vaccine too. I told everyone it was better than Christmas when I found out around the holidays that I had gotten the actual vaccine and not the placebo. It's been really neat to, to know that the one that I received is the exact same one that everyone else is receiving now. And despite some mild symptoms, she did not hesitate to sign up for the booster trials. The possible side effects were explained to me pretty clearly in the first round, and then when I got the booster, I pretty much knew what to expect. She is one of dozens of Americans testing booster shots for Pfizer and Moderna at Emory University and the University of Rochester, where trials are being held. I had no problems at all with the other study, and I thought it would be helpful as far as the advancement of the solution to the COVID um, pandemic, so I was happy to contribute. With 30 percent of U.S. adults now fully vaccinated, scientists are already looking ahead, trying to develop a shot that will protect against new versions of the virus that might emerge in the future. There is a possibility that a booster shot is needed. That's exactly what we're trying to understand right now. It's too soon to tell. While the current vaccines have been highly effective, one variant first identified in South Africa was proven slightly more resilient. Scientists have made this their target. We know that this is not the dominant strain in the U.S., but it doesn't mean that it could not become. Viruses are always evolving. The more they spread, the more potential for change. These booster shots are getting us prepared for new versions of the virus capable of outsmarting existing vaccines. We do know that with some respiratory viruses, like influenza, we know that we need to get a shot every year. And at least at the present moment, COVID-19 appears to be behaving somewhat similarly. Moderna and Pfizer are both testing different strategies. Some volunteers will get a third dose of the original vaccine, while others will get a shot that includes a tweaked vaccine specifically designed to target the South African variant. This week, Moderna published encouraging results from mice studies. What we observed in that experiment was that the mice who received a third dose of mRNA 1273 had post-vaccination antibody levels that were higher than those pre-booster dose. Now their scientists feel confident they are on the right track. I, I think for us, this, this had been a, a plus. Uh, the fact that we're particularly working on variant vaccine a clinical trial is just to be ahead uh, this time <laughs> compared to last year. Researchers say booster shots could be ready soon. The studies 
have been done. Uh, you have to wait a period of time for people to have an immune response. And then uh, we could consider, you know, whether or not it would go to the FDA. I do not think it would require um, these very large efficacy trials. These are considered minor modifications to the vaccine. But still many unanswered questions. How quickly will the virus change? And how often might we all need to take these booster shots? The, the variants are kind of the wild card. And so you're not just boosting, you're changing up the vaccine to cover these new variants. With a near 100% rate of preventing hospitalizations and deaths, mRNA vaccines such as Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine do have one key advantage. They can be updated quickly and easily. We are looking to see if we can create a prototype uh, vaccine where we can demonstrate that if you change the sequence, you can improve the antibody responses. And that may allow us to move to a situation in the future where emerging SARS-CoV-2 sequences can be swapped out of the vaccine to allow yearly boosters if they prove to be needed. For Becky, the benefits have outweighed her mild symptoms after getting vaccinated. Two weekends ago, um, my family was actually able to travel for Easter and go see some other family members that we haven't been able to see or be in close contact with for a really long time. So that was what kind of made it all feel worth it. And scientists are hopeful that these booster shots will protect us in the years to come. I'm optimistic because the original vaccine uh, worked better than anybody's expectations. I'm Bob Woodruff, tracking the vaccine. Our thanks to Bob for that, as always. And still to come, revealing his truths, a former popular Bachelor star comes out as gay, detailing his struggles. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning, number one in the evening, with America's most watched news Cast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. 
Welcome back, everyone. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour. The COVID crisis in one of the world's most populated nations is growing worse. Some are calling it a tsunami of cases in India. It is now second in the world in overall cases as cities like Mumbai prepare for a possible lockdown. Meanwhile, in Europe, Denmark has become the first nation to outright ban the AstraZeneca vaccine. The move is the result of concerns that it could lead to rare blood clots. And switching gears, Iran's president is calling that nation's decision to dramatically increase its uranium enrichment an answer to your evilness. He is directing those comments at Israel. Iran is accusing that nation of sabotaging a key nuclear site. Iran will now be enriching uranium at its highest levels ever. A former star of The Bachelor is now telling his truth after years of struggle. Colton Underwood, the former Division I football player who many remember for casually hopping a fence after being dumped, sat down exclusively with GMA's Robin Roberts and shares why he became The Bachelor when he wasn't really looking for a wife at all. Colton, thank you for this opportunity to sit down with you. Is there something that you want people to know? So can you tell us what you is on your heart that you want to share? Yeah. Um, obviously, like, this year's been a lot for a lot of people. And it's probably made a lot of people look themselves in the mirror and figure out who they are and what they've been running from or what they've been putting off in their lives. And for me, um, I've ran from myself for a long time, I've hated myself for a long time, and I'm gay, and I came to terms with that earlier this year and have been processing it. And um, the next step in all of this was sort of letting people know. I'm still nervous, but um, yeah, it's, it's been a journey for sure. Through the nerves, I can see the joy. I can uh, yeah. see the relief. I mean, I'm emotional, but I'm emotional in like such a good, happy, positive yeah. way. Um, I'm like the happiest and healthiest I've ever been in my life, and that means the world to me. And yeah. What was that moment like for you that gave you the courage to speak your truth as you are today? I got into a place for me in my personal life that was dark and bad, and I can list a bunch of different things, but they'd all be excuses. But I think overall, the reason why now is because I got to a place where I didn't think I was ever going to share this. I don't. I would have rather died than say I, I'm gay. Um, and I think that was sort of my wake-up call. Did you ever think about harming yourself? Yeah. Um, there. There was a moment in LA that I woke up and I didn't think I was gonna wake up. Um, I didn't have the intentions of waking up and I did. And I think for me that was like my, my wake up call of like, this is your life. Take back control. And I think looking back even beyond that is like, even just suicidal thoughts and you know, driving my car close to a cliff, like, oh, if this goes off the cliff, it's not that big of a deal. I don't feel that anymore. The former bachelor walking in his truth, while also realizing that his fans and the women he dated on the show may have questions. So many people were cheering you on and wanting you to find love, and now they may feel that you misled the public. And misled those women from that season. Yep. How do you address people who feel that way? I would understand why they think that way. And I mean, I thought a lot about this too, of do I regret being The Bachelor? And do I regret handling it the way that I did? I do. Um, I do think I could have handled it better. I'll say that. How so? I just, I just wish I wouldn't have dragged people into my own mess of figuring out who I was. I, I, I genuinely mean that. But I also, at the same time, like, that I can sit here and say I'm sorry to all of those women. I can also say thank you. Because without them, and without the Bachelor franchise, I don't know if I, like, this would have ever came out. Colton also sharing a message for Cassie, the woman he jumped the fence for on The Bachelor. 
Open the fence, guys. Open the fence. Their relationship ending tumultuously last year. Cassie filing and then dropping a restraining order against him. I would like to say sorry Thanks. for how things ended. I messed up. I made a lot of bad choices. Were you in love with Cassie? Yes. I mean, and that only made it harder and more confusing for me. If I'm being very honest, um, I loved everything about her. And it's hard for me to articulate exactly what my emotions were in going through that relationship with her was, because I obviously had an internal yeah. fight going on. I would just say that I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart. I'm sorry for any pain and emotional stress I caused. I wish it wouldn't have happened the way it did. I wish that I would have been courageous enough to fix myself before I broke anybody else. A weight now lifted as he steps into his full self after a lifelong personal battle with his sexuality, a truth he previously denied. I literally remember praying, praying to God the morning I found out that I was a bachelor and thanking him for making me straight. I remember that vividly of saying like, finally, you're letting me be straight. Finally, you're giving me a wife, a fiance, and then I'm gonna have the kids, and then I'm gonna have the house, and then I'm gonna have all this. I've known that I've been different since the age of six, and I couldn't process it, and I couldn't put my finger on what it was until high school, my freshman year, when I knew I was gay. And by that time, I had already grown up in the Catholic Church. I have gone to Catholic grade school. I had learned in the Bible that gay is a sin. Um, I had made mistakes in my sports and in my athletic career, and when you make mistakes, that play was gay or that was a bad. Gay was always affiliated with a connotation of negativity, and I think there's a lot of things when I look back, I'm like, no wonder I held it in. Some of the people that you've told are the very people that, as you said, like you played football with or friends who used a negative term yeah. about being gay, and when you came out to them, what was the response from them? You know, I, I've had, <laughs> I've had sort of a range of responses and the underlining, the most common one was almost like, I wish you would have told me sooner. And when I hear that, I wish I would have had faith in my friends and my family a little bit more. My dad, I told him and his reaction was sort of the same, like, I wish you would have trusted me sooner. But then he followed it up with, how can I help you? How can I help take this off your plate? Who can I tell? And like, to me, that was more meaningful than I love you. The only reason I'm sitting down with you today is because I have the love and the support of my friends and my family. We thank Colton for sharing his story and for Robin for bringing it to us. With spring knocking on the door, you may have heard of suns out, guns out, referring to those who wear sleeveless shirts to show off their muscular physique. That I had heard of, but apparently there is now a new saying that some are trying to get hip to, skies out, thighs out, which I had not heard of until now. Will Gans has more on what is apparently a new craze. The internet is short-circuiting. These photos of Milo Ventimiglia, now known to some as Thilo Ventimiglia, making headlines. The This Is Us star joining the likes of Michael B. Jordan, Zac Efron, and the more than 28 million TikTok views who are embracing the hashtag five inch seam. Oh my God, my fit is fantastic. Oh my God, my fit is fantastic. What about the rest of us? Are short shorts for everybody? I think so. Experiment with the inseam. Five inches now the new daring level, but try a five and a half, try a seven, try the eight and see what really works for you. So as the weather gets warmer, skies out, thighs out, baby. At least according to the internet. All men should wear short shorts. I will die on this hill. Hot girl summer? No, short shorts boy summer. In fact, Men's Health saying the summer of 2021 will be all about guys showing some leg. It's super flattering and it elongates the leg, if anything. 
So for those of us preparing to show some thigh for the first time ever, or at least since the Travolta days, be aware of the occasion. So if it's a casual beach moment, of course, you're going to rock that tank top with it and some flip-flop sandals, but you can dress it up. Do a button-down, long sleeve. You can do a polo. Just remember, there is a tasteful cutoff for everybody. I can go lower. So what are the big mistakes you think people might make if they're, they're well, going for the short shorts? The biggest thing that you, you want to be able to differentiate is there's a difference between short shorts and too tight of shorts. So you want to make sure that there's coverage. That's one of the basic things that you'd be surprised people make that error. So short but not tight. I'm here for it all, Will. Thank you for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.